Hello and welcome. This is Carissa Carner, your host. And today I am joined by Brooke Taylor. Brooke is incredible. She is a transformational career coach. She's an organizational consultant and she's a speaker and she helps professional women align ambition with purpose. Brooke was named a top career coach to watch by the Australian Business Journal in 2021. And her transformational group coaching programs and workshops at companies like Google, Uber, and McKinsey have changed the lives of over 3,000 women globally. That is incredible. Now, she is the global expert in a phenomenon that she calls the success wound the success wound. And she helps people get radically honest about what it means to create success. So I just love this. And I wanted to share too, Brooke just moved to Los Angeles. So she's very close to me. We're practically neighbors and she bought a house and I'm just so happy to have this connection and to welcome you here, Brooke. So tell us a little bit about you and who you are and how you got to where you are today. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to be here. Great to be with you. Great to be in LA. I was just living in Sydney, Australia for three years. So I'm so happy to be back in the US. <laughs> it feels like home. Um, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I always say it was Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley, meaning it was full of engineers and data scientists. And, you know, this ethos that I was really steeped in growing up was this notion of if you can dream it, you can build it. And, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. This very kind of positive American dream that was so motivating for me for so long was kind of very masculine energy, actually. Yes. But what I took it to be as is that if, there, if my will can be exerted on anything, then I can get my way. And growing up, I really learned that like intellect is king. And I went out to very kind of, uh, I was in very ambitious settings and ended up getting straight A's many, many times over. And when I'd come home, I'd show my dad the report card and I had never seen him more happy for me and more proud. He would like scoop me up in his arms and throw me around. And I learned through those instances that success equals love and belonging. And that coupled with this cultural upbringing really set me off to the races to truly believe that my self-worth was found in achievement and success. So fast forward many years, I took this kind of gold star chasing mentality through college, through our, my educational system, all the way to my first job at Google. And at Google, I ended up climbing the ladder, you know, pretty quickly and ended up at the same time feeling really burnt out. And it was, you know, around that time that I found drugs and alcohol as a means of coping and releasing the pressure. Mm -hmm. So I would be working, you know, crazy hours, Monday through Friday, sometimes even on the weekends, feeling all this intense need to succeed at all costs, right? Because if I wasn't achieving that, I didn't feel like I belonged, I didn't feel worthy. And then on the weekends, I'd be partying and drinking and finding my identity and external validation in other ways. And the culmination of these two things really brought me to my knees. And it's only now working with other women who are in that position or currently are in that position of really high achieving, can't seem to shut off their need to succeed or that need for external validation external validation at all costs. Um, and what I've been able to diagnose in them and also looking back on my own story is this concept of the success wound. And the success wound is the pain that comes from mistaking your success for your self-worth. And it's very prevalent in our capitalistic society. It's very prevalent in corporations. It's even passed down through generations inculcated through our educational systems, media, religion, et cetera. Um, and it, it really does get installed in our brains, you know, as early as, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and sticks with us for, for many years. So that's a little bit about my story. And there's a, there's a happy ending, of course. And of course, the story is ongoing, but 
I, I did end up uh, getting sober and I have ended up figuring out a way to heal my success wound and step into something I call conscious success and helping other women to do the same. So that's a little bit about my journey and my why in a way. Wow. That's so powerful, Brooke. And your ability to look inside and see that that's what happened for you, that your value, that knowing now that your value doesn't equal success, that your value is beyond that. And then showing other women how to uncouple those things, how, what an incredible impact you're making on the world. Thank you. It's yeah. been the journey of a lifetime and I, I love this work. Oh yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine it feels so good to, to help others even recognize the success wound. That seems like such an important piece is to be able to see that that's happening. Mm -hmm. It is. I, I shared with a friend of mine recently, she was asking me, you know, what does this work really mean to you? And I was just saying, I want everyone to be able to identify what their success wound is in the same way that we can identify when we're feeling anxious or when we're feeling sad or depressed. I want this concept to be commonplace. So some of the signs, you know, for the listener who's thinking, do I have this success wound? Some of the common signs are something I call the case of the when I haves, or when I have that next promotion, then I can finally get the job I want. Or when I have, you know, finished that project, then I can finally release the gas pedal. That notion of success being a destination, when I finally reach that place, then I'll be happy. Yeah. That's one big one. Another one is the belief that success requires a grind or a hustle or sacrifice. And um, that is a huge sign that you're living within your success wound. Another one is just any way in which you feel like your self-worth or your self-esteem rises or falls with your achievements and your success. Do you find that you're feeling, you know, really high or elated when, you know, when something good happens and you get that external validation? And do you find on the other side that you feel quite low and down on yourself not only if you're, if you did something wrong, but most importantly, in the absence of any sort of validation and listen, it's perfectly human and normal to work. We're, we're social beings. We want that approval. We want to seek that out, but is our identity tied up with our success and with achievement? Do we overly identify with being a top performer? Because the most, the most powerful force in human personality is identity. So checking what, who, you know, who am I without my success? Is this, am I overly identified with this is a really good starting point. That's great. So three really tangible ways that people can, can check out for themselves. Is this something that I'm struggling with? And the first one you said was the, the, when I have the, when I have, mm -hmm. that's great. That's such a great way to, to, to describe that and say again, what was the second one? The second one is, uh, let me see if I can remember. So the first one was the when I have. The second one is um, that kind of roller coaster that I just mentioned. And the third, I might have to listen back. I'm sorry, we can oh, cut this part okay. out. But. Yeah, the third one is that external validation of feeling those yeah. highs and lows you said. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect that back so that people can really, our audience can really take that in because- mm -hmm. That's incredibly valuable to have those markers to look at yourself and say, you know, is this something that I'm struggling with? And then Brooke, how do you help women once they identify that they do have a success wound? How do you help them heal? What's your process? So I have a forced out process and this process is called the conscious success method. And like I mentioned earlier, it's not just enough to heal our success wound, the question I get a lot of like, is the question of what does it look like once I've healed that? And what am I, what am I stepping into? Right. Ooh, wow. And yes, because in the same way, it's like, if we've healed our anxiety, what does that mean? Right. Does that mean we have more peace? Does that mean we have more joy? What's the antidote to the success wound? And it is this notion of conscious success. And I define conscious success as the choice to define success on your own terms and to make it be much more about the process rather than the outcome. And so conscious success is a state of harmony that comes from living in alignment with your own internal guidance system, which wow. is huge. Yeah. And so this four step process to really embody that conscious success, the first step, like I just mentioned, is to diagnose. So whenever you have a wound and you went to the hospital, 
you'd probably have the doctor take a look at the size, shape, you know, what caused the laceration? Is it infected? That's what you need to do first. So the first step is really to diagnose the size and shape of your success wound, asking questions like, what did success look like in my family of origin? What was I taught to believe about what the value of achievement and success might be? Other questions like, what am I subconsciously or unconsciously comparing myself to? What kind of ideal of a successful speaker or entrepreneur or woman am I unconsciously comparing myself to? So that's step one is to diagnose. And even as I'm just saying that, I'm just wondering if anything's, if, if you've asked yourself those questions in the past or, you know, what might be coming up for you too. Absolutely. I love that you ask that because I'm thinking about this as you're sharing it. And I think, oh, you know, I do have some external validation and oh, I, oh, and I do, you know, think about the grind. Like I have to grind to be successful. Mm -hmm. I have to work hard to be successful. And I'm wondering if you're listening, are you identifying this in yourself too? And then the other part that I loved of what you said is really helping women to look at the process and not so much the results. So that conscious success in part being about the process, the journey, as opposed to the destination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That is a huge mindset shift. And it's something that makes sense intellectually, right? Like we've probably heard this so many times, like the process is the point, find the joy in the creativity. And yet it's so difficult for us to actually embody, not just because it's a moral failing on our own, but I honestly believe in a capitalist society that values output achievement, Yes, you know, culminating, gaining power and control, that output is what we kind of, that's what we crave. And so taking this first step of diagnosing, you know, we, we cannot change what we're not aware of. And so diagnosing is a really great first step. And that's something that, you know, the listener can even do right now or right after this podcast. Absolutely. If you, if you don't know it's there, then you can't do anything about it. You have mm -hmm. to be able to diagnose it first. So yes. you said that's the first step and it's a four, a four step process that you, you take women through. Yes. So the second step is to plan. So in the same way, if we diagnose, we're saying, okay, this is the, this is the size and shape. Then our second step is to make a plan. What do we need to do in order to heal this? So in other kind of more traditional coaching modalities, this might be called a vision stage. But what I instruct people to do is to ask themselves the question, who might I be without this success wound, right? Ooh, who might I be? Question. Yes. Who might I be without this belief that my worthiness is attached to my success? And so what we, what things we can do are really getting in touch with who you are intrinsically at your essence, mm -hmm. who is that healthy self, that self that embodies what I, what is called the eight C's in our internal family systems model, which I can go into in a second, right? Which is connection, courage, being curious, centered, um, all the good C words. And so when we're feeling that way, we know that we're in our healthy self. And when we're feeling anything other than those things, we know we're in our success wounding. And so getting in touch with that healthy self and learning what her voice sounds like and what she needs in order to thrive and starting to take direction from that person, that's step two. I love that. I, I'm also a psychotherapist and that I use that in my practice. I, I actually use parts work in my practice with my psychotherapy clients. And I bring it out when I work with people who have a fear of speaking, of really looking at those parts of self. So I love that you bring in IFS internal family systems for those of you who don't know. And that model of getting to know the parts of yourself and getting to know what you're describing as that healthy self, the one that, that voice that really does know, I think how to tap into conscious success. A hundred percent. That's it. Wow. This is so exciting. I love whenever I can speak about parts work and internal family systems and, you know, this success wounded part that's the, in the model, you know, that's the exile, that's the wounded part, right? That's the part that has been victimized, you know, due to or hurt or wounded due to trauma um, from childhood or, you know, adverse impacts of certain occurrences throughout your lifetime. That's the part that this either overachiever 
or this even procrastinator or these protectors, right? These kind of adaptive coping mechanisms that are a symptom of the success wound are really trying to trying to protect. So for me in my story, right? It's the, it's the perfectionist, it's the overachiever, it's even the addictive part. I was trying to protect from feeling low self-worth or feeling not good enough. So all of these different parts of myself that ended up hurting me in the long run came out as a means to try to protect myself. And so this, pro- this four-step process is really just about restoring self oh, with a capital S. And I love that perspective too. I, I talk about this in my TED talk that you're not shaming or trying to, you know, exile the part. You're not saying it's bad or it's to be gotten rid of, but instead just welcoming it in, getting to know it. Like, where did this wound come from? What's the size and shape of it? How can I be with it so that I can actually heal it and step into conscious success? rather than saying that's bad and wrong. And that's a part of me I don't want anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's exactly right. In the founder, Richard Schwartz, he says that there are no bad parts. And Mm -hmm. I think even just that in and of itself is such a relief, right? That, you know, my, whether it's being a high achiever or even a procrastinator, right? Because that can be a symptom of low self-worth too, or even fear Um, that these these two things are really just all trying to keep us safe and well. They just maybe have the wrong strategy to do so. And so, you know, really getting in touch with these various parts of your personality, these coping mechanisms, these protective parts um, is, is hugely healing in and of itself. Oh, it really is. I think it makes all the difference. I just, that's so exciting. And I want to just give a little note, maybe to explain a little bit more deeply what we're talking about. For those of you who are thinking, what's parts? Well, what's parts work? What is IFS? What is this? And it's a way of looking at your whole self. You're still one whole self, but we all have different parts of us. So I like to say, you know, there's, there's a part of me that's sitting here doing this interview and connected to Brooke. And then there may be another part of me, like, even before I got on the interview today that I felt a little bit nervous. So there's a nervous part of me, even though I've spoken so much and, you know, I've been doing these podcast recordings, that is a part of me who's nervous. And then there's another part of me that's confident. So we all have these different parts within us and it's just a human experience. So even though you're one person, you are a system of parts. That's the perspective that we're talking about. Anything you want to add to that? Beautifully stated. That is beautiful. I think the question I had when I first heard about this is why it's called internal family systems. Mm -hmm. And this is something I find so interesting, which is the fact that the founder was actually a family therapist originally. So he would be in the room with, you know, the, the shy, the, the shy child, the angry mother, the, you know, victimized father, the crazy uncle, whatever it is. And they'd all have these parts that they were playing kind of in this family system. And he said that we have those parts too, like within us. And so that's why it can sometimes seem as we go about our lives that we have almost like these different personalities or quirks or different versions of ourselves that show up in these different contexts. It's almost like we have this little family inside that's vying for attention and for a word and edgewise. So I just, I always think that that's so interesting too. Uh huh. It's great. The internal family. Yes. Thank you for explaining that. And, and I wanted to ask you, you know, you are, you have done such an amazing job of finding your expertise, really connecting it to something you're passionate about, and then packaging it in a way that you can share it, that you can go to organizations like Google and share it, that you can do work with your clients, stand on stage and speak about it. And I was wondering if for our audience, you would say a little bit about your process of how you, how you did that, how you, how you packaged this incredible expertise up. I love this question because I think especially for entrepreneurs or sole proprietors or people in the services space, whether they're, you know, thought thought leaders in particular, right? The question is, how do I present my knowledge in a way that's digestible, that's impactful, 
that leaves the listener or the audience member with something actionable and something tangible. And a process that I went through with my coach, shout out Jess Geist, she's an incredible coach. She helped me to look at the patterns of the people that I was working with also in my own story and say, what is the one thing that they were all suffering with? What was the one thing that was kind of holding them all back? What is the problem? What is the core problem? And so the way that we did that was really through pattern recognition. And that would be my recommendation for anyone who's in a thought leadership space is really get drilled down into the most essential problem that your audience or your customer is facing. And I think the way that I've been able to package this up that's resonating so well in the market, but also on my coaching calls is such that anytime somebody comes to me and they're, they're, they're kind of in my target market, they really feel seen because I have such a good grasp on what this problem statement is. Mm -hmm. So speaking to them in their language has been huge um, and really understanding what those pain points are in a way that's not you know, typical, this concept of the success wound has never been talked about. It's been talked about in various other forms and I hear it so frequently, but packaging it up in this way has made it a lot more tangible. So it's almost like bringing a metaphor and bringing language to something that hasn't been brought language to. And I think that that is what makes writers, successful writers so exceptional and successful speakers so exceptional is that they're able to point to things that we're all suffering with and bring language to them in a really transformational way. So again, it's pattern recognition, using the customer's language back to them and bringing, of course, your own story and experience to that as well, as well as um, metaphor. Mm, I love that. I love how you said that you're bringing language to something that didn't have language before. That is, whew, that gives me chills. That's so powerful. You really are doing that. Thank you. I think, you know, if I think about some of the authors that have, or even speakers that have changed my life, it's people who have, you know, spoken the words to me of something that I'm suffering with that I didn't know anybody else was. Mm -hmm. And I hear this a lot, even in 12 step rooms, I got sober through, um, through 12 step recovery. And part of our healing process is to speak about you know, both our pain and our joy, but also the ways in which we recovered and the strength that we have found as a result. And the thing that got me sober is really hearing other people's stories mm. and hearing them name the things that I was struggling with in shameful silence for so long. And that is what built trust. It's what allowed me to name and kind of take the shame away from some of my experiences too. And that feeling is really what I'm trying to give to the people in my audience, as well as the people that I coach whenever I'm speaking. I'm like, I just want this to feel like a recovery meeting. And you even see that in like, really think, you know, like Glennon Doyle, sober, Brene Brown, sober, Gabby Bernstein, like Dak Shepard's podcast is so popular because he's bringing this recovery. They're all bringing work, like this notion of 12 step recovery into their work. Mm. And so that has been kind of like a tenant of my work as well. Mm, wow. What a cool parallel to, to, to bring that spirit of healing and, and the power of story of having someone else put words to something that you feel previously like can't be spoken, that there's so much shame around it, or there's so much wounding around it, that it doesn't have any language. And then to hear someone like you, Brooke, put language to that, what a healing process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, again, that's what makes the best speakers and the people who are in my audience and come to me and say, you know, I've been, you know, I, I, I just don't know how to say no. Uh, to more projects at work, or my, I cannot be present with my kids. It's so shameful. I'm just thinking about work all the time. Or people are saying, I'm just not living up to my potential. I'm seeing myself, I'm seeing my friends surpass me and I'm comparing myself to them. They think these are unique experiences. And when we can say, you know, no, actually it's not your fault. It's because of this success wound and it's because of something that's been programmed within you and passed down through generations and is reinforced through our educational system and through capitalism. It's almost like this weight is off. And that's not to say that, you know, 
it's not incumbent upon them to change it, right? Because if we're circling back to our four step process, the third step is to heal, right? And that healing process is done through the internal family systems work that we mentioned. It's done through subconscious reprogramming. Um, and this is when the person is really able to kind of step into uh, their, their self with a capital S, their, their centered, courageous, confident self. Mm -hmm. But it, it first, they first do have to kind of hear, hear the truth and kind of hear the transformational story, um, because that is what relieves shame. And I think this whole process is just really about shifting shame. Mm, yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah, so what's the fourth step? I want to make sure that we include that here, not leave everyone hanging. What's the fourth step in your process? Yeah. So once we've, you know, once we've diagnosed, once we've made a plan, once we've started to heal some of the causes and conditions that led you to where you are, then we go into the emerge stage and the emerge stage is where we actually take tangible steps to activate on the plan that we stepped that we created in step two. So that could look like a new job search. It could look like stepping into a new management role. It could look like um, something as tangible as creating new healthy habits. It can look like really just kind of allowing the person to get to their next level that they weren't able to reach because their success wounding was keeping them stuck in this kind of this pattern. Mm -hmm. So if we're using kind of 12 step recovery language, really it's around practicing these principles in all our affairs and actually what do we do once we've actually put the drug down once we've put the achievement down meaning our addiction to the achievement right or I, I always say that healing the success wound and, and living in conscious success I'm not going to make you a monk it doesn't mean that you're going to renounce like all material possessions and, and go to the mountains I want you to have the success that you want but I want it to actually feel fulfilling so in step four, that's where you actually go after some of the things that you've been wanting to achieve and starting to actually live in the way that you want to live and noticing and feeling the difference. A lot of my clients will say that they feel like they have a new brain. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that they've been doing might be similar in the sense that like their job might not change or their relationships might not change, but the way that they show up for interact and feel within those contexts has completely shifted and they feel more comfortable in their own skin. And that's some of the same results I see in, you know, in sober recovery too. We have to put down our drug of choice before we can actually start to heal. And that's what this whole process is about. Yes. And this really, you're defining what you were speaking to earlier about looking at what happens after, what happens after you identify and heal. What does life look like after? I love how you, you really unpack that for us and you unpack that for your, your clients in that fourth step. So, so one last question before we start to wrap up today, which is how has speaking played a part and, or has it played a part in your success? And maybe a follow-up to that too, is how might identifying and healing the success wound help someone be more confident sharing their message when they speak? Speaking has been such a growth driver for my business. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most important business development strategies that I have as a coach who sells high ticket offers and who wants to not only change people's lives, but also get this message out using my voice and my affect and my presence mm -hmm. is the best way that I can possibly do that. Mm -hmm. Very tangibly, whenever I do a speaking engagement, I book a client, whether that's in uh, going to a, a company like Google, whether that's doing a conference, whether that's even doing a webinar. And the more that I am anchored in this message that I've just shared with you today and why I'm here, as well as the more that I'm anchored in the solution of like, why is conscious success so important? Why is healing the success wound so important? that translates so well. And I'm a huge fan of speaking for this. I know, you know, I would rather do a Ted talk than write a book, although I'll probably do both. Right. But I, I love speaking for that. And I found even as an audience member going to people's talks, those are the things that have changed me the most more than reading any book would. And so your second question was how can healing the success wound make somebody a more effective speaker? Mm -hmm. I noticed that, that when I'm in my success wound and I'm on stage, I am trying to 
energetically get approval from the crowd. Mm -hmm. I'm putting on a show Mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. It it is performative. It's Mm -hmm. not of service. If I am in my conscious success, which says that if I'm showing up on this stage or in this webinar or on this podcast to help give a message that's greater than myself, then like all the pressure's off. Mm -hmm. The audience can feel the difference. I'm not here seeking approval. It's not the Brooke Taylor show. It's about the person in the audience and being of service to them. Mm -hmm. And again, this is where I take that kind of recovery meeting context, which is I don't show up to a 12 step meeting to get well for myself anymore. I show up to help the person who's still struggling, to help the newcomer, to help the person who really is, you know, needs to be shown the ropes. And so when I can speak from that space, that's when I'm embodying my conscious success, my healthy self. I'm not looking for approval from anyone else. I'm much more powerful. And so I think the best thing that any speaker can do is to heal their success wound and to redefine what success means for them. Oh yeah. That it's a process to get to that place, to really be in yourself. And what I teach speakers as well is focus on that connection, make that connection with the audience and be of service. And I love what you're saying that when you do that, you're more powerful. You are more powerful. Your message is more powerful. You, the audience feels the impact differently. And then when it comes to tangible results, you're actually getting better results as a businesswoman, as an entrepreneur, when you're in that space of giving, of being in service. hundred percent. Well said. Yes. So if there was one thing that you wanted our listeners to take away today, one thing that you want to make sure they leave with, what would that be? I would really want them to answer just at least one of those diagnosed questions. And that is what ideal of success are you comparing yourself to in this moment or next week or tomorrow? Is there some sort of ideal of what a successful woman looks like? It's a successful speaker, entrepreneur. I want you to write that out. Like, what do you, what do you, what is this ideal and where did it come from? And in what ways are you beating yourself up in the gap between where you perceive yourself to be and that ideal that you feel like you're not meeting. And the reason why I'm having people diagnose this as opposed to leaving them with a kind of a more upbeat thing is because I really do believe that this is the starting point and I want them to start diagnosing their success wound so that they can start to unravel it. I feel like that is just the right next action for the audience. Oh, I love that. And that is so valuable, such a valuable takeaway. So really taking that time to look inside and see what it is for yourself. What, what does success mean to you? And then also charting back, mapping back and looking at where that came from. And that's the foundation, right? That's the foundation that the healing can come from, but you need that first is what I hear Brooke telling us. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, Brooke, thank you so much for all of this. This has been so incredibly valuable. I know I'm taking this in, I'm digesting this and I'm going to, I'm going to look at my own success wound after hearing you speak today. And I know you have a free offering for our community. Can you tell us where people can find that? So the number one question I get from women who come to see me is how do I get unstuck? How do I get unstuck? And through these patterns around lack of clarity of what's next for me or lack of clarity around my success wound or uncertainty of where to go next in my career. And what I've done is I've created a really tangible worksheet for folks to get unstuck and to take the right next action to create success within their career that actually feels successful and aligned so that you can access that free worksheet at brooktaylorcoaching.com slash unstuck. And we'll put that in the show notes too, I think. We sure will. And it sounds like that worksheet will help with that piece that you want listeners to take away, which is to get clear and identify their own success wound. Is that right? A hundred percent. That's a great starting point. 
That's fantastic. So I just want to say that link one more time. So you can find that at Brooke Taylor coaching and it's B R O O K E T A Y L O R coaching.com slash unstuck. So make sure you download that. That is going to set the foundation for you to identify, diagnose your own success wound. And I know if you want to work with Brooke, if you want to find out more about her, you can go to her website and you can learn more about her offerings. Is there anything else you want to say, Brooke, to our our listeners? I would just encourage everyone to really think about the ways in which our world might change if we all adopted this notion of conscious success, focusing on the process and focusing on finding the joy and the pride in what we have currently, as opposed to continuing to go on this cycle of pursuing achievement as a way to self-validate. I think that leadership and this next generation of leadership is only possible if we really take a look at how we define success. And so I would encourage you to really think about how you can play a role in shifting our world just by diagnosing your success wound and redefining success. Oh, so powerful. Thank you so much, Brooke. Thank you for being a guest. And it was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. You too. 